Vaheguru Ji Ka Khalsa, Vaheguru Ji Ki Fateh. Welcome everyone and thank you all for joining us today on the fifth day of Sikh Coalition's Summer Series. The Sikh Coalition Summer Series is a week-long virtual event bringing community members together to join from one another, discuss important issues, and engage in fun activities for all ages. And today we are so excited to be able to welcome Bipin Kaur and Malika Kaur. Malika Kaur is a lawyer, writer, educator who focuses on international human rights with a special specialization in gender and minority issues. She holds a master's in public policy from Harvard and a JD from UC Berkeley Law School, where she currently teaches. We also have Dipin Gore, who is a PhD candidate at Yale. She is studying insurgency, post and post conflict politics with a regional focus on South Asia. And she is currently working on the ethnic politics of counterinsurgent deployment in Indian civil wars. Welcome, uh, Malika and Dipin. Um, we're really excited to hear more about your session and to the audience who don't are not very familiar with what this session is about. Uh, Malika Gore will be discussing her new book, Faith, Gender and Activism in the Punjab Conflict, The Wheat Fields Still Whisper, uh, while highlighting Punjab's hazardous human rights movement. And Dipin Gore will be sharing her reflection on what the book adds to prior understanding linking it to her own PhD work um, after, you know, 25 years after Punjab has been declared post-conflict. And so with that said, Dipin Gore and Malika Gore, I'll let you take it away. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Indipreet. Vaheguru Ji Ka Khalsa, Vaheguru Ji Ki Fateh. And wherever, uh, I'm going to say good morning here from California, but wherever you're listening in from, thank you so much for joining. So this is, this is the book uh, that in the pre just mentioned that I uh, wrote over several years, but re was released just a few months ago. And as the title suggests, the wheat fields still whisper. The, one of the reasons that the book, I think, is so, um, the book was so important for me to write and um, is important now in today's context to reflect on is that we often think of there was a conflict and then we're taught it ended, usually in 95 or so. And then that's, um, you know, that was that really. Punjab went back to its usual um, eating, overeating production, uh, enjoying life, and you know all of that kind of stereotype. And we know very much, sadly, even from the news um, out of Punjab today, we know that the conflict um, ha is brought up very often times um, to, to still clamp down on difference and dissent and is used almost as, as an excuse um, for, for a lot of, uh, for, for a lot of prevention of people's um, exercise of basic rights. So today in 2020, if you're in the US and listening, or if you're really anywhere in the world and listening, we know that protest, the right to dissent, the right to differ, uh, who gets to decide who is allowed to protest? What are the rights of protesters? Are all protests equal? These are things that are very much on people's minds. And um, we will try through the session Dipin and I will try to relate as much of, um, and, it, and it's not, we don't want to make some sort of false kind of uh, connections of, you know, this is exactly the same, it's always been the same. No, there are lots of differences. Every political moment is different. A lot has happened in the last three decades, um, but we, we will make connections where we see them relevant to citizen activism today in 2020. Um, and before I uh, go further, I do want to say I'm really glad to have, have the been here on this call. You'll see on this in this session, you'll see um, you'll see why I, I really wanted to invite her to have this discussion because she brings um, not just a close reading of this book, but a close a close reading and a closer reading of our recent history and connecting it to the present and is doing new exciting work, um, which which Punjab and other parts of conflict in South Asia really deserve. So she brings that humble. Um, curiosity uh, to, to this work that I, I hope people listening, especially younger folks and um, students listening can really learn, uh, learn from and be inspired by. So thank you, Dipin, for, for being That's here. That's too kind, Malika. Thank you. Thanks everyone for being here. 
And so um, we will actually travel back, right, Devin? So we're going to travel back to 1989. Um, it's, I'm picking an excerpt kind of from halfway uh, through the book. So I'm going to start um, reading from, from there, and then we can, uh, yeah, and then we can discuss. I cannot remember exactly how I first met Justice Vance but I do remember how we all surrounded a police station together. A gossamer white chimney pulsates on Baljeet Kaur's shoulder against the beat of a ceiling fan. They had picked up a boy, kid his family called him. He was only about 20. When asked if there were other women protesting that day, she gently shrugs, I think no. A dimple momentarily appears on her bronzed face. They had their guns drawn out. We said, we will walk in unless we get what we came for. And I told the men, Justice Bands and my brother, please stay behind. They won't shoot a lady. The lady, now 75, shifts a little, adjusting herself on an emerald green cushion, the seat of a large, sparklingly re-warnished cane chair reminiscent of a different era. Well, at least it was less likely for them to shoot me. She pauses to swirl a silver spoon in floral china, a photograph of a bearded man with a sun visor over a small turban, golf club in mid-swing, looks over her right shoulder. Jigjit Singh Gill had passed away three years earlier of natural causes. Jigjit didn't know we had gone to surround a police station, of course. She stares down at the receding vortex in her teacup. Silence around complicated relationships with the beloved dead is deemed best. Ultimately, it worked in the sense that this was the first time the police met human rights resistance on their own turf. It was July 1989 when 20 people surrounded a police station in the sleepy town of Khadar. Kulvinder Singh, kid, had been taken by policemen on July 22nd in broad daylight in front of witnesses. By July 24, kid's father, Principal Tarlochan Singh, learned that the same police party had staged an encounter with two Sikh boys. He quickly approached the high court for an order to prevent secret cremations. The resourceful father made appeals to all quarters, including some of the most high profile human rights figures of the day. So I'll stop there um, and I'll, I'll turn it actually to Dipin. Um, Dipin, what, just if you could speak a little bit about what what you hear when you hear that passage again or what you think about. I mean, Malika, this is, I'd, I'd preface that by saying that this is, this description and this very careful and well-written description is far from unique in, in not only the conflict of, the, the conflict that spanned almost a decade, but also in your book, you don't, you know, you take each case and you make it sound so wonderful and it's so detailed and you add so much value to each each story that you bring out but i think for this one particularly basically it's not this story is not unique in any way right it's emblematic of a much deeper and widespread trend of police violence that uh, was very prevalent at the time at the same time i think this one stands out to me because baljeet kaur despite or maybe even as a function of her privilege is unable to get her husband fully on board with the idea of surrounding a police station she says that he didn't even know what she had set out to do at the same time, she exudes a certain confidence at the initial stage, asking the men to step behind because they won't shoot a lady. Presumably, this confidence would also reduce over time as the conflict goes on and as women also become targets of conflict violence over later years through the conflict. What struck me most, however, is what you sort of move on to later in the chapter, Malika, when you connect the dots to this case and your ongoing interviews with, with Baljeet and your other three protagonists. So you say that you found out about the kid case again while you were reading the news in 2012, and you find that the, those that were um, accused of kids' disappearance were eventually acquitted. It stood out to me as a testimony of how long the arc of justice runs in conflicts in South Asia and across the world. And sometimes that's often the point, right? That cases would outlast the lives of its pursuance, but your close tracking of this and so many other cases is just another reminder to me of why these stories are still as relevant today as they were in 89 and why we should still care about it 25 years on. Yeah, the, the fact that this story is not unique 
Um, and in fact, it has been, it, it, it's repeated. The story of the disappearance that is, uh, yeah. is not unique and that it's been repeated time and time again. And in fact, some of these people, um, kid, his father, they may have been immortalized or their stories have only been immortalized um, as headlines of, you know, or as bylines or sometimes far into a newspaper article from those times. Um, their stories had never been been told fully before. Uh, and and I think, and not just, not before this book, I think before any human rights, um, any writer or any researcher walked in and said, oh, I want to know more about this behind this name. Um, so I try to find stories that I had not read more about and I had just read surface level information about. And, and even, you know, I've, uh, I've done human rights work um, for, for a little while, but writing, myself writing reports or reading reports, there's only so much that one does in legal reports. Um, and there, there's so much more that lies beneath. So the stories that the fact that the disappearances aren't unique is heartbreaking, as is the fact that the stories of resistance, um, such as Biljeet Gore's in this case, um, and her comrades in this case, that those stories are in fact unique. And that combination, right, of widespread impunity um, coupled with unknowns, at least for us, and that's how I entered this work, um, for a lot of us just unknown stories of human rights resistance. That's really what, what brought me to writing, um, writing about this book. And I think you, the point you're making about the, the, the privilege that she did enjoy um, and then at the same time, other oppressions um, or, in, or other challenges that she had to live with, that was really interesting in talking to different people as well. And I think that's where the, the gender lens really mattered because women's stories, um, even if it's, you know, they're focusing on their work as Biljeet, um, as Biljeet Koranti often like would talk and would focus on, well, this is what we did. And then if you really probed her more like, oh, right. So when you started doing this, when you went from homemaker to traveling in a beat down Maruti car alone with a driver in the interiors of Punjab, like who took care of the home? Who took care of like what, how did you negotiate all of that? That's what got really interesting for me. And that's where you get these tidbits and I leave them for the reader to imagine, like, what does it mean when she just says, and then one respects her silence when she just said, well, he didn't know, right? And she just kind of leaves it, leaves it there. I think it's important to highlight that combination that you're talking about and that this, the stories of citizen activism stand out as unique, even though the cases of state violation of dissent, repression of dissent are really not unique in any way. Uh, but at this time, actually, let's hear from the audience a little bit. So uh, if you can see the raise your hand function, uh, those that are listening in, you could use it now. Otherwise, just drop us a very quick chat. Uh, how many of you have visited Punjab in the last, say, five or 10 years? Lots of raised hands. That's awesome. Great. Okay. And then just, uh, I'm, I'm curious as to how many of you have read Malika's book so far. No bias there. I'm a big fan, but that's, that's pretty obvious as of now. Okay, quite a few. That's great. So Malika, for those that haven't entered the book yet, uh, I think it's, it's important to point out that you say at the very outset of the book that this is far from a detached account of the history of the Punjab conflict. And instead it's a project in understanding and sort of peeling off the layers of complexity that conflict brings to the table while also documenting the resilience that comes with conflict. So what is it that you set out to do and how and why did you do it? Well, I, I can tell you what I didn't set out to do. I did not set out to write a book. There was no, um, you know, as you know, I'm, I'm not a career academic. I'm, I didn't have any sort of deadlines or requirements um, to, to write any sort of, you know, larger project. I, it eventually became a book, but what I really set out to do was a personal, and this is why the detached account um, or, or taking myself entirely out of the final product was impossible. And I thought just not honest because I, I really set out as it, on listening journeys. I came 
to the protagonists of this book and, and you know, the, you see three protagonists up on the cover and it's really through their stories, um, Justice Ajit Singh Vance, Baljeet Kaur and uh, Inderjit Singh Jeji. It's through their stories that uh, I tell multiple stories. So the book is not just about three people, but it, it, is, um, it is using their life journeys and their am amazing contributions to talk about other life journeys and contributions. Um, but I really came to Baljeet Kaur and um, Inderjit Singh Jeji and Justice Bansa's stories in this personal quest of almost like, you know, will the real human rights defenders of Punjab please stand up kind of a thing yeah. because you know, we, we honestly, I know it sounds, I, I was saying it like this recently to a teenager and I thought that's actually how I was thinking. I was kind of like, where are our human rights defenders of our recent history? Because when we remember our older history, right? Um, for those of us who stand up in Ardas every day or several times a day, think about kind of where that history, right? Think about that part of the Ardas. Where does that history stop? So I see Puratan Kal de Shahidano and Jinane contribute Kita and sacrifice Kita. We remember them every day, if not multiple times a day. And then we come to our contemporary history and something shifts. We are defensive, we have caveats, we have footnotes to everything, or there's silence. Um, and the story of Punjab, as I studied other human rights, um, other conflicts uh, in both in South Asia and in the other, part, other parts of the world, the story of Punjab really feels like it's been told only in very violent centric terms. Um, and that no, that's not in itself a problem. We, we should, it's conflict. We should talk about violence and who were the actors, et cetera. But I think we get stuck in it, um, in that conversation so much that we stopped asking like, who are those six who just in, like in the spirit of the first Nanak, stood up and, um, and really put their own privilege, again, just like the first Nanak, I always go back to the Janehu story, who put their own privilege on the line when they didn't need to and, and tried to do something about what was happening around them. And, and then the other part of it was as a woman, as a, as a sick woman, I really could not accept what I was often told, often by non-Sikhs who were studying Punjab um, or some who had not studied Punjab but spoke about it anyway. Um, I was often told sick women don't want to talk about this, right? There's a lot of this, all this, and there's this almost fetishization of izzat and honor and um, just silence that women, you know, the women are not going to talk, but you're never going to get these stories from women. They don't. Want, and as a core, you, you, I knew that wasn't true somewhere deep down. So I went looking for these stories. And honestly, if you ask the right questions and are willing to sit with silences and respect them, people over time open up about stories. And um, I think as I heard these stories, you know, there's a beautiful Maya Angelou quote that there's no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. That's really what I think happened over time. I, I truly um, began to think more people need to hear these stories because Punjab has been a laboratory of India's nation building, right? 1947, consolidation, um, borders, 1960s, 70s, cultivation, the very anti-revolutionary green revolution and all, all of that experiment on Punjab. And then you have the 1980s and 90s and it's castigation, discipline. How do you, how do you quash uh, uh, people who are trying to rise up or trying to ask for rights? And, and mind you, these were rights that were being asked for, for everyone, greater autonomy, greater socioeconomic rights, et cetera. And, and these multiple upheavals about Punjab had never been told from my perspective in a, in a way that was true to the way people tell the story. So the way people tell the story doesn't start with 84 and end in 95, where it doesn't say, First partition, oh, then skip ahead to 84, and now we're here. And, you know, that's not how people talk about it. People talk about it in layered ways, um, you know, and in almost like, you know, Jimmy Kutta Guni, the end, like there's, there's all these things that at some point you forget, like which, which part started where. Um, I think that's really, that I want it to be true to the way our people talk and be confident about how we tell our stories. Um, so I, I, the way I do it in the book also um, for those who haven't yet had a chance to look at it is I, I weave an earlier timeline starting with the end of the Sikh Raj from 1839 up to 1984. And I weave this timeline into 
the nine chapters of the book that look at each focus on a seminal year of the conflict. And I start backwards from 1995. So there's a descending timeline, contemporary history timeline, if you will, from 95 to 84. And then there's this other timeline from 1839 to 84, and they kind of converge. Um, they, they converge in the final, final chapter um, because there has to be some sort of structure to help, uh, help readers follow along. But you will see that there, there are just these, um, these layers of the story that I, I thought were important because a lot of how the human rights defenders and, and others I was talking to in Punjab, a lot of how people think of ourselves and our history and their, their reasons for doing things had to do with the history they relied on, had to do with things that they had just inherited as and that was part of their DNA um, even from times that they may not have personally lived through, right? There is this like idea of, of what um, Sikh pride is based on, what are Sikh values, and those things informed then how they reacted uh, during the 80s and 90s. So uh, the chapter we're looking at right now, kind of halfway through the book, looking at this kid's story, I think this is telling too, because this chapter then goes later, because we're halfway through the book at this point, this chapter goes in the earlier timeline, goes into the 1970s, the Naxal movement in Punjab, um, when Punjab police first began, its, which became its training ground for um, torture and for disappearances. At that time, much smaller scale, about 100 kill deaths, but it really doesn't matter because even one body tortured in that way is one too many. And it gave, began to give this sanction that police can respond to um, respond to people's movements and people's threats in this way where the state has full control and, and full impunity. So I think the, the, that's when, you know, we're talking about kind of how I feel like a completely detached view doesn't work. Um, I, I, do, I do explain why I weave all these things together kind of in the beginning. And I, and I also um, try to insert myself a little bit in the story so people can see why, what I'm getting from them. And I believe that's a sanction for each reader then to think about what can they get from them as well. Malika, absolutely. Like you were saying, I think what stood out to me most is that you let people's stories take the lead. So you want the voice of the community to come forward, but you do that in ways that are, you know, the, their, their stories in the form of quotations are, you know, revealing the words that they use, even if they're very colloquial, they, they, they sort of, they reveal rough edges, even around some of the protagonists that you're talking about, to be able to show us that not everyone's perfect, and there's sort of shades of gray in everyone's form of activism, right? At the same time, uh, you apply your analytical lens at every stage, and, you know, every time someone uh, describes things to you, you're sort of going back and triangulating things and then providing your own uh, insight to, to that event. But what, where I think it was most valuable to me personally was how you probe gender at every stage. So not only, like you were saying, asking people like Baljeet Kaur, what's happening in your home while the women are away, but also asking women who are holding down fort while the men are away, because the men are often targets of uh, all of the violence that we're talking about. So asking women how, you know, they're holding down for how they're dealing with uncertainty and, you know, the perseverance that is often expected out of the women of Punjab uh, at this time, at a minimum, and the activism or the, or the active insurgency that they display uh, through, you know, the protection of their homes, through active participation in the movement, or just through the Chardi Kala in the face of great loss that, that so many of them exhibit is, is just, it's wonderful. But also, like you were saying, I think for uh, thinking about positionalities and how protests today might function, uh, you mentioned that a lot of the three protagonists whom the book is centered around and who form the channel of telling sort of these broader stories, all three of them come from very elite and privileged backgrounds, and they've given up, actively sacrificed a lot of comfort and maybe more comfort outside of Punjab to be there and to actively serve in their roles during the conflict. But uh, at the same time, it's, it's striking to me that there are so many people in the same positionalities, but very few are actually anywhere near a police station asking for the release of, of the disappeared, right? So as we think through who, who participates and who forms the polity in 2020, I think it's important to think about how positionality is transferred to uh, different forms of action or inaction in, in what we see today. 
Yeah, I, I think that, you know, that, that's what's so fascinating, like sitting, and this is what struck me, this is what I mean, once I started hearing these stories, mm -hmm. I wanted more, and I wanted to share them. Um, sitting with Baljeet Kaur, for example, in her, uh, you know, who's always so well put together in her crisp cottons in the summer, while like other people are just, you know, like me, like sitting there like, oh my gosh, um, she, she's always so poised, so amazing, sitting in her you know, nicely done living room. Suddenly we're talking about her being outside her Tana, asking for the release of a young boy from the village um, who had just begun um, second, who had a few years earlier, just begun secondary school in Chandigarh um, and 84 happened. And after that, he came on the radar somehow of the police. Um, his father was the principal of a local school principal, the Rochin Singh. So it, just see, realizing that like, in that circle of middle upper middle class six mm -hmm. how there were people who had these amazing stories that just over time had been become more invisible um, to our detriment because then if these stories became invisible and, and you now we can say yes these elite stories um, but they're also exceptional stories because they're using their as you said they're using their privilege in a way that's um, that's unique and and I think that that whole aspect, like they, they became invisible to our detriment because we then fell into these tropes of, oh, the movement was, yeah, the movement, see, city people never cared, city people weren't affected. And you know, all these divisions, Malway, Maja, like all these divisions have helped um, obfuscate and, and, and helped detract us from the actual issues. Um, and, and the actual fact that the community did have a lot of solidarity the community did have a lot of cohesion in the immediate aftermath of 84. And then, of course, you know, things, uh, things erupted in many, many different ways, uh, the after effects of which we see today. Um, but let, let me ask before I, 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 want, I do want to tell, the, you know, the audience a little more about the kids story. But let me also ask the audience if you could answer in the chat, who are your favorite Punjabi citizen activists? Any time period, right? But you can tell our conversation is trying to focus a little more on the contemporary, but could you share, could folks share as I, as I speak on and explain a little bit about, um, about what happened in the kid case particularly, um, and I talk about the citizen activists, the Luchan um, Singh, I would love to hear just what folks have as their favorite Punjabi citizen activists or the most prominent. And even though we're focusing on the conflict, Malika, like you pointed out, Punjab has been the laboratory for a lot of nation building exercises for the rest of the country. So it's seen a lot of movements over time and we'd love to hear from you about them. Yes, absolutely. Just one thing, Kalra, um, as, uh, as, as, as he should, is popping to the top of the list. Um, that's where I start in the first chapter of my book. I start telling the story both of just one Singh Kalra, somebody else wrote Kalra, and I'm, I'm trying to, you know, there's so definitely many. just one Singh Kalra, and then there's the other Kalra, Paramjit Kaur Kalra, who became, you know, and, and this is the other part that was really exciting for me when you start asking the stories, the why of the why, and the stories behind the stories. Mm -hmm. I, I start in the first chapter explaining how she even became almost by accident. Uh, married to just one Singh Kalra. And that came out of um, another history and her own and some actually some tragedy in her life that brought her fortuitously into the Kalra family. And then she's living this life, busy life as a working mom. She was working, had two kids. Um, and then just one Singh Kalra who, uh, who had exposed the mass cremations in Punjab. He himself becomes one of Punjab's disappeared in 1995. And she has become a citizen activist um, par excellence in her own right, um, as have her children. So there's this uh, definitely, uh, yeah, somebody else wrote here, Paramjit Kaur Kalra. Um, Mata Gujri in the, uh, you know, so again, I, I try to see as I'm saying them all together, I might be like, oh, okay. Mata Gujri, Paramjit Kaur Kalra, in the Jeet Singh Jeji, Kalra, um, Bhagat Puran Singh, yes. Like all, I feel like all these spirits kind of, you know, we, we stand on, uh, on the shoulders of giants and these spirits travel through any citizen activist today looking for inspiration within our community um, and, and I hope beyond. So I, I, was, I really hope this list can become longer and for our current generation, it's not, we, have, we shouldn't have one or two examples. It should be like these endless list of people that we can name because there really is an endless list of people yeah. who did did it work in Punjab. So Principal Talochan saying, I'll come back to the kid's story. 
Um, he was not only active once his own son got dis was disappeared. He, as the name suggests, and that's why I keep saying Principal Tarlochan Singh, he was the principal of a small Khalsa school, um, a small secondary school. He, he had the good fortune of being more, uh, he was educated, he was more outspoken, he was somebody who was seen as always standing on the side of um, side of the truth and was also thus considered a thorn in the side of the state. Um, so what happens when kid disappears, I'm going to come to that, uh, and disappears, right, let's, let's look at the language there too, in broad daylight, um, in a Mohali satellite of Chandigarh, neighborhood surrounded by people, um, kid is picked up by the police. And so if from the newspaper reports, as uh, you mentioned later in the chapter, I talk about these, one would think that kid, um, you know, something happened and he went off from home and then we don't know where he went. And some people say he's a militant. Some people say, no, actually he's disappeared in front of a whole neighborhood of people. So when we say disappeared, all we mean is that the police refused to return him or his body. It doesn't mean no one knows where he went. People know exactly where he went, which officers took him, etc. cetera. Um, so after Cora and her comrades surrounded the police station, they had received word that Kid's body was in Roper, a city in southeastern Punjab. The Roper hospital was skittish when the human rights team, including JG and in the, um, in the JG and Justice Bands, when the human rights team arrived in July 1989. Doctors said they must obtain orders from higher ups before showing the body to the family. So JG and Bans went to meet the concerned officer. The deputy commissioner pretended he was busy working. Justice Bans and I sat at the back, JG remembers. He had us waiting for an hour and a half or two hours and then he said, okay, I give you permission to go to the hospital and see the body. When we went to the hospital, we were told the body has already been taken away. When we went, the bloody chaps were buying time. They were all working in tandem. The DC was very much in on it. He had waited to get the message that further, to send the message that further pursuit had been made impossible, that they could now just wave us all along. So this body had been cremated as unclaimed a little while earlier. Therlojan Singh's petition to the high court asking for an order to prevent exactly such a cremation had gone unadmitted and unheard. Then a police post was said to have kids ashes, says Baljeet Kaur. They told the principal, here are two urns. Pick whichever one is your son. What does one do? You pick one up, put it in the water and consider last rites completed. Six cremate their dead and release the ashes in flowing water. This has unfortunately been the end um, or even less than this in terms of information and closure has been the end for way too many kids of Punjab, right? And that, that is, that's what kept driving the protagonists in this book to continue their work. I think keeps driving um, people like the Ben and me to this history because it's quite fantastic um, actually. And, and we talk about Chardi Kala, it's really quite fantastic to look at a story like Pr Principal Talochan Singh who went through all of this and then ended up in a situation where he spends two decades fighting for his son's case, but not just his son's case. He actually is at every unrelated um, protest and campaign. He's part of so much else that happens while he's being charged with false cases because he's pursuing his own legal case. He's been taken to torture centers himself. He's been arrested. He's dealing with all of this, but he remains completely part of the larger society that he finds himself in, the society that was in a lot of conflict that, at that time. And even as they tell his story, um, the you know, JG and Indrajit Singh, uh, JG and uh, Baljeet Kaur had, had always had these fond memories of, you know, principles. So I was, he was still, he had a lot of sedge. He had a lot of calm about him. He had accepted things that happen a certain way that you fight injustice, but that doesn't mean you lose yourself. That doesn't mean you become bitter. That doesn't mean, so, you know, it, it, again, it, we can look to Gurbani for this and, and you know, the, the, the simple ways of, you know, I love that Oscar Wilde quote, it takes a great deal of courage to see the world for what, is, what it is and to still love it, right? So I, I, that's, I think, another part of why the book is not, uh, it, it didn't make me sad doing this work. I thought it was really inspiring, um, in fact, to get to gather these stories and to tell them because these stories may have risen from tragedy, but they're not tragic stories. I think, again, like this case, even the stories of resilience that you chart, this is not the only story in the book that charts that, right? I, I remember 
Uh, there's a story about a mother losing her very young son while he was still in college, but her still saying, Tera kia mitha lage, right? So I think that, that sort of spirit and that sort of resilience and for instance, Principal Parlochan Singh is just going to every protest quietly and standing in solidarity with the larger cause and being able to connect to causes that are beyond his own self-interest is really what the point of the book uh, becomes in some way, right? That Charting that resilience over time. But also, uh, as you were saying about the unknowns with each specific case, I think more broadly, the book also stands as an inspiration for those interested in the conflict or in Punjab more generally, because there's still so much that we don't know even about the conflict, right? So you pick on the human rights, uh, gender and sort of resilience through what is brutal torture by the state. But uh, there, there's still a lot of topics that remain undiscovered. And we, you know, I think it would be great for people listening in and for your communities to take up the conflict. I think Malika's book makes the case that these questions are still as relevant today as they were uh, 35 years ago. For, for instance, I think as an example, Malika, you mentioned in your book that uh, there's a disproportionate focus on the events of 84. And while that is really uh, something that stays in the psyche, lots of scholarship journalistic accounts, and I think the general public imagination is pegged there and stops there to the detriment of other unexplored parts of the conflict. So I think that would be, that would be really great things that Malika and I would love to read about, and I'm sure a lot of people uh, here would love to read about as well. So for instance, I'm interested in how states and insurgent groups aren't sort of frozen in time as you know, institutions, but they evolve over the course of the conflict in response to each other and how the state over time is able to co-opt dissenting ethnicities to help its own counterinsurgent ends. So how it's able to take people from within movements and use them uh, to, to be able to put down movements that are expressing dissent in, in some way. But coming back to 2020, Malika, uh, I think we've discussed uh, how our attention is always a scarce commodity in view of all of the competing demands on it. So is there, is there something that you'd like to either read out or talk to us about in terms of how, what, and there, there's also actually a question which would be relevant about here, about how you would connect what's happening during the conflict to what's happening today in the world or what was happening in the world outside of Punjab back then in the time that we were talking about. Yeah, I think this this competing demand on our attention is not a new thing, right? So the, what's new is all the media, is all the constant, like it's in our hand, in our cell phones, we're getting nonstop fed, bombarded with information. So it might feel, I think it, it sometimes might feel like now we have so many things to, you know, there's not one thing I, I can or should focus on, but that's always been the case, right? And, and it's always been the case that the world can, is, is erupting in, at many, in, on many issues in many places at the same time. Um, you know, I, I, won't read, I won't read all of this. I'll just read to you the right immediately, a little bit I explained in the beginning about right immediately after 84, just to situate readers who, as right now, readers in the book and for right now listeners who might not even have been born in 84 and not realize what the world looked like then. Um, so, you know, just on the heels of the November 84 anti-Sikh pogroms, thousands were killed and disfigured, but this time in a gas leak in the foreign-owned Union Carbide plant in central India's Bhopal region, and attention turned to one of the world's worst industrial disasters. Then, as Chernobyl was melting and mutating citizenry under forced unawareness in 1986, Punjab secessionist movement had reached its true peak. While uh, mothers of Plaza de Mayo in Argentina were marching for the disappeared, Punjab's boys were practicing guerrilla warfare, which brought the Indian politicians to the negotiating table. As the Berlin Wall fell and the United States unipolar moment began, Punjab's countryside was alight. The homespun militancy was as popular as the, at the grassroots as it was hounded by the state in 1989. By the time Yugoslavia was coming apart in 1991, the real threat of Punjab's militancy fragmenting the Indian nation had been, had been undone. As the world watched Mandela being elected in 1994, prisoners of conscience had been murdered in Punjab, chilling civil society. As the 100 days of genocide in Rwanda highlighted the horrific threat threshold of the so-called international community, Punjab was calling for international monitors to assist with counting its dead and so on, right? We've, 
And this is just to say, these are all, hopefully some of these things, sadly, or, you know, but, but hopefully some of these things ring bells for you. Like, wow, this was not at all long ago, right? And these, we have a lot what that was unfolding in our history as world events kept taking over. Um, and, and I think that's true right now too. As we think about the world in 2020, my, my big lessons, my big takeaways, and, was, and this is where it's really useful talking to you, they've been about takeaways before the session, because a, a big one is it's okay to define your activism. It's okay to say, this is something that is happening that is um, a persecution of a people or quashing of a movement that I care about and I'm going to work on. It doesn't mean that I don't care about what is happening elsewhere. Um, but, you know, we, we do have a mandate, right? Nichandar, Nichat, Nichihoat, Nich, that Nanak Tinke Sangsat. We do have this mandate that we actually do align ourselves with the most unprivileged, with the most underreported, with the ones whose stories are not being tweeted, right? So, Pick, I think, pick your, pick your challenge, um, pick your unpopular struggle and stick with it. Uh, and that, if that happens to be the struggle of your own people, that is absolutely fine. We, we don't have to justify to anyone why, we are, um, why we're picking that struggle because there is not just that the history is unreparated in Punjab, that's bad enough, but the present is causing yet more situations. We just this morning have a, a story of a death by suicide um, in Punjab right after being picked up by the police, right after being interrogated. Those are things we really need to care about and beyond, beyond tweets. And um, this is again, I, I will say another lesson from the protagonists here. They worked really hard. They learned um, new tactics and the tools of the day for example, I have the story in here of how Baljeet Kaur first goes to Amnesty International and takes them their very first video evidence of what happened in Punjab. She had no idea. She actually says, I asked them, like, how am I supposed to, like, there are no timestamps really on it. How do I get validated? What do I do by consent? These are all things she figured out. These were new things to her. She figured them out. Just like today, we might say the war is on social media. We need to battle ideas. Let's talk about it on social media. That's fine. But then to back it all up, that's actually probably true. There's a lot that has to happen with media and social media, but to back it up, we need to be grounded in our actual knowledge and the work needs to be put in as well. Um, Dipin, do you have, do you have more to share uh, just from how you connected to today and lessons? I think when, while you were talking about how we need to have this knowledge, it's also a broader knowledge of history, right? So just recognizing, I think for me, the biggest lesson is just recognizing that our history is not a distraction from the present. Instead, it's it's our strength purely because the challenges of today are, are really not unique in history is almost both cyclical and parallel in nature. And your, the paragraph that you just read out about the Berlin Wall and Yugoslavia in relation to Punjab, but also when we think about just the nature of protests today, right? The protests in South Asia, the, in various parts of South Asia, the protests in the diaspora about Punjab, but also America's own reckoning moment with its own politics. It's just, if we need to situate on ourselves in our history to see what we can learn from it and apply it to today. Um, the, the advantage of that is we also prevent some burnout because people have made mistakes and done some experiments in the past that have really worked. So uh, that would be, you know, just, just a better understanding of our history, I think is, is a case that not only your book makes, but also just in general, something to keep in mind while we think about parallels from the past to 2020. But Malika, if it's okay with you, let's take some questions. There's a couple of questions coming in and please keep sending your questions on the Q&A uh, bot over there and I'll keep, I'll ask Malika uh, these questions. So Malika, this is probably related to what we were just talking about right now, but uh, a question is what do you expect the readers of the book to do with what they learn from what they read? Yeah, that's a to each reader and what brings them to the book. So I don't have a special prescription for action immediately after reading this book, but I have, I, I would have a hope for some action of some sort. Um, I think it begins also with, with language and how we, how we think about how we speak about our history, right? There's, um, you all heard in the, in the right in the first segment, uh, encounter, right? Encounters a euphemism because, and it's actually justificatory um, kind of language that we're taking up what the police 
used as an excuse to kill so many in Punjab. I similarly explain why I resist using the term even Blue Star, because yes. again, we're using the army's code name, accepting the army's or the Indian state's idea of, uh, or justification for the attack across Punjab in June 1984. Um, you know, to call it the massacre of June 1984, to call it the Kalukar of 84, I think matters because it, it, it really matters to, uh, in order to identify where are the gaps in our knowledge and where is a lot of the, and, and, and helps us identify really the gaslighting. Like, why do we yeah. doubt ourselves so much? What has given rise to that doubt? So what I hope readers will begin doing as they see the stories in the white spaces, you know, of newspaper articles, because there's the newspaper, there's the black and it's like, here, it's written in black and white. Well, who did the writing? Who did the editing? Who did the censoring? And then what are the stories in between I hope this will give some readers at least a framework for reading today's news, for actually saying, you know, what, 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 is, what is this kind of narrative that's entirely missing what the people think or the context, et cetera, et cetera. And, and hopefully some of you will be prompted to write and some of you will be prompted to research. Um, as they've been mentioned, the unknowns about this time are vast uh, and they're not just uh, the unknowns on every element, right? So when I say faith, justice, activism in the Punjab conflict, on all those aspects, there, there are lots of unknowns. One more hope I have, what I think would be great is if readers start looking for stories about people beyond the named leaders of the day. So instead of getting stuck on personalities and this politician did this and this political um, you know, a, agent or agent provocateur did this, I mean, why don't we start, because eventually we, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. We keep focusing on the, on the negatives and on people that we mistrust instead of focusing on people who we could learn from, people we could stand with, people we could work with. So I, I really hope whether it's in Punjab or you're looking at other activists today, um, many of them who are jailed from poets to uh, law professors to students in India today, today, like as of right now, this day, whoever you're looking at, I really hope you can fixate and actually get obsessed with their life stories so you can walk alongside them and we can all make some make some change in this world where we feel like there's a lot of shrinking space when it comes to comes to dissent. So I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not, I don't have a prescription like sign this petition or hope you do X, Y, Z, but I, I do think there's a way of thinking that hopefully this book can support and that, that way of thinking is one focused on activism and response to persecution wherever we see it. So the, the tweet sized version of your um, lesson is to celebrate those that can't be tweeted. That's, that's quite ironic, that, but at yes. the same time, I mm -hmm. think that when you say get fixated on stories, I think people need to know that your fixation wasn't sort of one visit or two. It's sort of, it's been a labor of love and ethnography that spans almost a decade of meetings with and about the protagonists that, that you talk about. So that's just one of the things that would really stand out in the book once people start yeah. to read it. Yeah, no, so, and, and yes, multiple meetings. I don't mean that, you know, you harass people or stalk people, you know when to stop. Um, but you, but there's a difference in, um, you know, going in with a very extractive kind of uh, me bent where it's like, hey, I want information on XYZ versus what here my my whole hope was to capture more life stories and that takes a while because people have themselves put away certain memories and certain stories and they come back slowly and i think that slow process of uh, a story collection helps oneself too because it's a slow then it's a process also of kind of journeying with them as they're collecting they're recollecting their thoughts and and it's i think it, for me personally it was very rewarding so if you have a Here's a prescription, right? If you have a parent, grandparent at home, a friend, a relative whose story from those days you've never heard, ask them, right? Whatever perspective they might have. And then don't judge them on every perspective. Like if they're saying, I voted for so-and-so, I thought that was the best option. Okay, right? Take it from there. Hear the rest of the story. I think that would be a, that would be a fun rest of this summer project to do. Right. I think it's it's also great just as a quick addendum to that. You know, I think Malika, you also sort of catalog moments at which you're told to stop and some visits are, or some interviews are deemed to be unwise as you write in the book. So it's, I think that process of navigating space and where and how you fit in to that larger context are all very important things to be thinking about while we do exactly what 
uh, you're asking all of us on this on this call to do today. So Malika, here's a uh, conflict related question. Uh, someone wanted to know how class based politics played out in relation to the overall Sikh political desires for an independent nation at the time. Yeah, I don't know if I'm the if I can speak in, in those broad strokes of here's how the upper class wanted or didn't want something. Yeah. But what we do know is that those with the most privilege, those with the least to lose, mm -hmm. are oftentimes the last to raise their voices. And that's the tragedy of the world all around, yeah. right? And I think that's the beauty of what we've been taught in Sikhi, that no matter how much you have, actually, the more you have, the more yeah. is your responsibility to do something. Um, mm -hmm. And it's not charity. It's actually bound up, your, your liberation is bound up with, with others, right? That famous Aboriginal um, women's quote from Australia, right? If you've come here to help me, right? Stop. But if you've come here to help me because your liberation is bound up with mine, let's work together. Um, so I, I think most, my, my takeaway from everything I understand and see is that upper, the upper class, so to speak, rich people, people who had the least to lose were like in Punjab, like in every other part, not that it's excusable, but it's something common shared across the world, were the first ones to align with the state. Um, and that alignment may have happened even just in forms of silence. They just, they're silent collaborators, um, then they're the more active collaborators. But what I find really, really telling, uh, and as you read the, for those of you who read this, or those of you who might find accounts from that time, newspaper articles from that time, something happened um, at that, you're a political science student, so that, that critical juncture of 84, right? something happened where the Sikh community, um, even the very elite in the Sikh community were very much felt a sense of identity. There was a lot of cohesion and it actually, um, it broke away, splintered very quickly, but even people with a lot to lose put their, put their names and words out there about, this is absolutely atrocious. And more than that, that something big structural needs to change. Whether they were all together saying we all need a separate state in those exact words, um, that is debatable. I don't think that was something that was done by the elite um, and by the rich six en masse, but something pretty close to that was happening. And in the years that follow 84, as I mentioned, the state was at the negotiating table. History has been rewritten now, but let's not forget when parliamentarians running on the platform of Khalistan won, white, won landslide victories in Punjab, right? As Rajiv Gandhi's leaving his office, he's having to release um, people from jail because they've been elected MPs. So that history is also part of our history. We can, now it's been made into a dirty word, but that was a political platform that people were running on and winning and some elite people. Um, with elite backgrounds were winning. So I think class has played a big role in invisibilizing the, um, the, the torment Punjab has gone through. Class has played a large role as it does everywhere because people become comfortable, they become complacent, and then they become worried about giving up the least of, least of their um, comfort. Uh, you know, Inderjeet Singh JG, he, so we've talked about Biljit Kaur today a, a bunch, but Inderjeet Singh JG went to jail. Um, he, was, he was arrested 28, 29, Actually, I'm understating that, but he often does himself. He forgets how many times. Um, but he always kept his relative privilege. He always said, like, Sanu jada ni kuch karna si, so it was okay. Um, he knew, and this is why they knew they could put their bodies in the way outside of Tana because at most they thought we're going to be taken in. They didn't think that they would be vanished into the dark night. And then comes 1992 and Justice Bans, as a retired judge of the Punjab and Haryana High Court, gets picked up on the most posh lane outside the Chandigarh golf course, um, mm -hmm. not to be seen for the next two, three days while his family's helter skelter figuring out where he is. And he's sitting in jail under the Draconian Tada Act. Uh, the, today's version of that is the UAPA. But he's sitting there under the TADA um, Act as an anti you know, state actor with very little proof against him. So they did, there are elites and people, rich six who did, did suffer, but I think um, we, I make a conscious point here and they make a conscious, this is why I chose these protagonists, they make that conscious decision to show that what they suffered was very um, minimal compared to what a, a person just for being sick, walking while sick, living while sick in Punjab was suffering back, uh, back in the day. Absolutely. So Malika, we only have a couple minutes to go. Uh, 
just zooming out a little bit, there's a question about the resources that you would recommend for young people today that would want to learn about the Punjab conflict and other people that took a stand during this time? Um, yeah, I short of sending you to the footnotes of my book, uh, right? And I try, and this is one of the reasons there are so many. Each chapter has, uh, you know, it, 100, 150 notes just for this reason that you can turn to a lot of um, a lot of documents, a lot of material out there. Um, you know, there are seminal books on on the conflict itself. Joyce Pettigrews comes to mind. Cynthia Mahmoud's comes to mind. Um, but I think it's also really important if you read Gurmukhi to read things in Punjabi that have been written. So I'm happy for Pan. But I know um, you know we're short in time. I am happy to send lists to people who are interested. And depending on your baseline, too, it matters. If if you haven't read anything about the history of Punjab before, it would be really good to read more of a survey survey text mm -hmm. um, and then pick on portions of it that you find uh, most interesting. So yeah, I'm, ha I'm happy to share, I'm happy to share resources. And if nothing else, I'm also happy to just give you lists from, from my book and the sources, because I, I can tell you my journey of learning about this as well. Right, and I, for one, I think have a huge running list of notes from your notes that are sort of further reading from me. So it's at, like we were saying earlier, I think your book is making the case for how much there is still to be known. So in some way it is, it's sort of opening the gates to a much larger conversation that we hope to keep having uh, over time. But Malika, is there anything you'd like to say to the audience before we wrap up today? Yeah, I, I think I would just like to leave you with this, this, you know, this thought that having curiosity is something we've been, we're innately blessed with and it's something we should um, keep alive. Having feminist curiosity is even better. And, and that doesn't mean that we're obsessed with just women's bodies or something like, oh, we're just obsessed with periods or we're just obsessed with sexual abuse. Like people think weird things almost when we say, let's look at gender, let's look at feminism. It also okay. means like people like me and Dipin um, who, are, who are women who identify as sick women who are interested in stories that um, in, in many ways are largely still about at least the research that exists are about sick men, but we're not, we're not making that differentiation based on we don't want this story, we want this story. Instead, we're entering it saying, we also want to know some more stories. We also want to know what is it about being a male? What is it about occupying that male body that particularly mm -hmm. made the sick male vulnerable? What is it about the male body that makes it particularly hard for sick men who underwent sexualized torture to talk about it, right? So having gender, a, a gender lens and feminist curiosity, I think will help giving an overall picture and will really uh, hopefully help us get those nuances that, that make these stories very relevant to our lives. For all those women there who are, have partners who don't support the work they do, for example. Um, I'm fortunate to have a partner who does support my work, but I work with women every day who who have to negotiate their identity just the way Baljeet Kaur did. And I think knowing these stories from the past gives us some sense of both solidarity and sisterhood and, and, um, and community, and also gives us the sense of, you know, it's, there's a lot, a lot more to do to make our own community more equitable and the rest of the world, hopefully a little less, uh, a little less painful. So that's, that's what I'll leave it with. I, I find a lot of hope in our, um, in our history. I don't think that could be better words to wrap up this seemingly never ending and dark time with that message of hope Malika is well timed and very well received I'm sure. So thank you so much everyone for being here today. Uh, Malika and I are reachable over email. Uh, it's malikakor at gmail.com and dipin.kor at yale.edu if, if you have any questions, if you'd like lists from Malika, or if you want to know more about the book, we're, we're here, please shoot us an email and be in touch. Thank you. And thanks again to Sikh Coalition. Thank you, Nupi, for organizing. Thank you, Dipin. Thank you, Malika. Um, thank you all for joining us uh, today. And a special thank you for Dipin Gore and Malika Gore for sharing their time and their expertise. This conversation was very eye-opening, and it makes me even more excited to read Malika's book. And um, if you have any further questions or want to connect with our speakers, as Dipin had said, you can do so at dipin.gore at yale.edu. And for Malika, it is just malikagore at gmail.com. Um, again, the Sikh Coalition Summer Series program is continuing until Saturday evening. So please take a look at the rest of the week's schedule and make sure you register at sikhcoalition.org 
slash summer series. And we hope we see you again this week. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye, Guruji Ka Khalsa. Bye, Guruji Ki Fateh. Bye, Guruji Ka Khalsa.